because economic development is a process of structural transformation, means that you need to have a continuous technological innovation, industrial upgrading, improvement in hot infrastructure, as you just referred to, and also soft infrastructure as institutions. And uh, in this process, you need to have the first movers. You need to compensate the externalities that first mover provide. And also, you need to coordinate the improvement in hot infrastructure in institution. And those kind of things cannot be internalized by the first mover themselves. And so the state need to play an active role to enabling this process to occur smoothly. Well, I think that if you have a good you know, selection and implementation, the infrastructure project can be self-financing, self-decretation because it's an investment now. Certainly, you, know, you need to have fund to make those kind of investment. But the investment will increase productivity, generate a return in the future. And those kind of return will be sufficient to pay back the investment now. I think the difference is that the structuralism won to you know, support development of industries which against the country's compared advantages. And uh, the structuralism advises country to build up large-scale modern industries on the basis of poor agrarian economies. And uh, for me, economic structure is endogenous to the endowment structure. So that means that when you are poor, your competitive advantages will be in abundant labor or abundant natural resources. And then you try to develop labor-intensive industries or resources-intensive industry to you know, utilize your abundant resources and to make you very competitive. And if you are very competitive, you will accumulate capitals. And when you have a capital accumulation, then you are great to more capital-intensive industry. So it's a step-by-step, -step, and it's more pragmatic and easier to implement. And also, this kind of process will be you know, more likely to make you very competitive. And so you know, it's a process which can lead to the success of the economy instead of in the past. The structuralism uh, had a very good intention, but the result in general is very poor. I think there are several ways, you know, my positions are different. The first one was the cause of the financial crisis. Because it's a common view, the global financial crisis was triggered by the global imbalances. And the global imbalances was the result of, you know, policy manipulations in the East Asian economies, including the export-oriented growth strategies and the intention for share insurance and also the undervalue of the Chinese currencies. And those was those were the common views. But I examined those kind of views with the empirical evidence and I found none of them can be supported. And uh, the reason from what I see uh, was policy mistakes in the reserve currency country, namely the US. Now, they had the financial deregulations in the 1980s, and they had a very you know, loose monetary policy after the dot com uh, 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 crisis. And those kind of policies, you know, causing the dramatic increase in liquidity, supporting the housing bubble, equity bubble, and, uh, and, and those kind of bubbles certainly had the wealth effect. So 
household overconsume. And uh, that was the reason for the trade deficit in the U.S. And this kind of deficit could be sustained for a long time only because U.S. currency is the reserve currency. So I found the commonly accepted view just point the fingers to other countries. But in effect, the causes of the crisis is rooted in the reserve currency country. I think it's an attempt to improve the government function to support the, uh, the structural transformation. Because as I mentioned, economic development is a process of continuous operating in industries. And uh, for the government need to facilitate the improvement in infrastructure in the institution and so on, but the government resources are limited. So the government need, needs to strategize the use of its limited resources to support the sectors which are consistent with their competitive advantages. And so the growth identification and facilitation provide a framework for the government to identify the sectors they are likely to you know, have competitive advantages and uh, to diagnose what kind of mining constraints those kind of sectors face and, uh, and allow the government to use its resources effectively. I think there are some differences here. Certainly, you know, there's one commonality. That is, we all agree the government needs to play some kind of facilitation role. But the gross diagnostic advocated by Danny Rogic is based on the surveys of the existing firm in the economy to find out the mining constraints. But that approach has two limitations. The first limitation is that some of the firms might be the result of the old input substitution strategies. They may be in a sector which the country does not have competitive advantage at all. And so certainly they are facing mining constraints, but that does not mean that even you, you know, remove those kind of mining constraints, they can be competitive in the international markets. That's one thing. And secondly, economic development is a process of continuous upgrading or diversifying to new industries. If you only survey the existing form, you can never find those kind of new industries. So those are the mining constraints. But my gross identification and facilitation can address these two constraints in the gross diagnostics. East Asian economies, including Japan, in the 19 post-war periods, they basically modeled after the U.S. economies. And because at that time, U.S. economies was the most dynamic economy, and Japanese economy was about 40% of the, the per capita income in Japan at that time was about 40% of U.S. per capita income. So they look into the tradable industry in the U.S., the mature tradable industry in the U.S as their industrial policy target. And then you can look into you know, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore in the 1960s, 70s. Basically, they use Japan as the reference country in design of their industrial policy. And then you look into China in the 1980s. They used the four small dragons, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, as their reference economies for their industrial policy. So you can see all these successful country, basically, as you say, they follow this kind of approach intuitively. But I think that my you know, gross identification and uh, facilitation try to generalize their experiences and into a framework every country can follow. Yes, I think it's important because China, you know, started the transition in the late 1970s with, you know, a structure as a legacy of the older policy regime that was planning economy and with the intention to build up the capital-intensive large-scale industries on the basis of a poor grain 
agrarian economy. So under that kind of situation, you know, many, many state-owned firms, they, are large, they were large, but they were not viable in open competitive markets. And China adopted a dual-track approach. On the one hand, continue to provide transitory support to the old sectors and to achieve stability. But on the other hand, liberalize the entry to new labor-intensive light manufacturing sectors and actively facilitate private sectors, both domestic private firms and uh, foreign direct investment to go to those kind of new sectors. And I think they were consistent with China's competitive advantages. So they were very dynamic. And that was the reason why during the transition process, China could maintain stability and dynamic economic growth simultaneously. As I just explained, that was in the transition process, to carry out the transition process pragmatically, because you have a large group of non-viable firms there. If you do not provide support to them, they will go bankruptcy, causing huge unemployment, social instability, and political instability. And with that, certainly you cannot have a dynamic transition process. So recognizing that, you continue to provide transitory protection to them. And then liberalize the entry to the new sectors, which were replaced in the past, but they are your competitive advantage sectors. And also support the domestic firm or foreign firms to enter into those kind of sectors and to allow you to grow dynamically in the transition process. Uh, middle income trap is an observation, you know, in the post-World War II periods. Most of the middle income countries actually, they failed to narrow the gap with the high income country, for example, U.S. And we call this kind of situation as middle income trap. Um, but the reason for a country to have the middle income trap it's because a country unable to have a very dynamic structural transformation in order to continuously improve their labor productivity and income labor faster than the high income country. And, 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 and as I said, the reason is because they are unable to have a dynamic structural transformation. And the reason why they could not have a dynamic structural transformation, I think one reason is that the government did not play the necessary enabling role to overcome the externality issue or coordination issue. That is innate in the structural transformation process. I think that China has the potential to maintain another 20 years or 8% growth. It is because China is still a middle-income country. For a middle-income country, in the process of structural transformation or industrial upgrading technological innovation, China can still benefit from the technological gap, industrial gap with the high-income country. So technological innovation or industrial upgrading, China can still rely on the borrowing of technology and industry from the high income country. And that kind of potential reduce the cost of innovation as well as the risk of innovation. And that will allow a developing country like China to grow in a service times faster uh, than the high income country. And especially, you know, at stage at this stage of China's development, which is a gap to the income country, it's very similar to Japan in the early 1950s, Singapore in the mid 1960s, and uh, Taiwan, uh, Korea, in the mid 1970s, and for those four East Asian economies, on the same 
technological industrial gap with the high-income country. They were able to maintain 20 years of 8% to 9% growth rate. Since they could realize 8% to 9% you know, growth rate for 20 years, that means this advantage of backwardness or the latecomers' advantages would allow China to have another 20 years of around 8% growth rate. Well, I think that uh, it's not the forward, it's continued growth, right? And uh, certainly, if China can maintain that kind of growth, China will be a high-income country by the time of 20, 20, 20, 30. And uh, China will be the largest economy in the world. And the Chinese economy like to be double the size of the U.S. economy by the time of 2030. It's a you know, historical pattern. The successful country they started with, they were intensive in the trees. Uh, and, and when they are successful, their wage rate will increase very rapidly. And so they will lose the competitive advantages in those kind of mature labor intensive industries. So the relocation of those kind of mature labor intensive industry to low income country is a necessity for their country to continue to upgrade to the higher uh, value added more capital intensive sectors. And this relocation certainly will be going to you know, areas with their low wages. And currently, we know African country, uh, they compared to other country, uh, country in other continents, in general, their wage rate is much lower. And so they have good opportunity to accept this kind of relocation of labor intensive industry from China. But certainly, the government need need to play the facilitation role in order to create the necessary infrastructure and institution to, you know, uh, to accommodate those kind of labor-intensive labor industry to relocate to their country. And if they can do that, they can grow as dynamically as China and other East Asian titles. For example, Ethiopia, it has a abundant supply of you know, educated young labor. Their wage rate is only about one-tenth of China's wage rate. And they also have you know, supply of lasers. So under this kind of situation, footwear industry should be their you know, sector with competitive advantages. And as long as they can actively you know, invite the footwear industry to relocate from China to Ethiopia. They can immediately turn that into a very competitive sectors. And uh, <coughs> I advise the former Prime Minister Manas in March 2011 and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, discuss with him this new opportunity for Ethiopia. But one thing is that you need to have you know, firms which will be able to you know, utilize their labor force and organize them into effective production and then producing goods with consistent quality and can deliver the goods according to the contract so they can reach market timely. And, uh, and, and those kind of ability certainly is the best way is to find the existing firm to come to Ethiopia. So I suggested him to do investment promotion in China and uh, he followed that. He went to China in August 2011, invited some firm to visit Addis Ababa in October 2011, and one of the firm was convinced. So immediately to recruit 86 workers. Sent them back to China for training of three months. And then started in January 2012 with two production lines, 600 workers, and uh, by March 2012, they started to ship their 
you know, designer shoes to the U.S. market. And uh, by May, the same year, the firm became the largest exporters in the laser sectors in Ethiopia. And uh, by the end of the year, the firm, you know, employees from 600 to 2,000, increased to 2,000. And uh, more than double the laser export uh, from Ethiopia to the global markets. And by the end of last year, the firm expanded its employment to 4,000. So that was a quick success story. And like you know, the success we observed in you know, other East Asian economy during the catching up stage. And if Ethiopia and then that country could do that, then other African countries can also you know, do that. And in effect, the firm produced such a demonstration effect. Before 2012, Ethiopia, and to some large extent, you know, no one really believed African country can be the manufacturing flow for the global markets. But because of the success of the single firm, Ethiopia government in 2013, last year, set up a new industrial park and built 22 factory units, eight built and 14 on the plan. But within three months, all those 22 units were leased out to 22 firms in footwear and garment and uh, with expo you know, orientation. So that means that um, you know, once you demonstrate the possibility in African country, I think that foreign direct investment will come, foreign buyer will come, and then they can have a very dynamic growth pattern as we observe in East Asian economies. I think that's a cooperation because China and African countries are at a different stage of development. So their competitive advantages are different and their economy are complementarity to each other. I think that uh, wider can play a very important platform to exchange ideas in different parts of the world because we are in a globalized world. Country in different stage of development, they face different challenges. But the experiences in other country can always provide both inspiration and experiences to address the common challenges or to tap into the potential and to you know, utilize each country's potential. Well, I'm very delighted to see that because structural transformation was a topic people neglected for a long time. And now we come to an understanding structural information and transformation is the nature of modern economic growth. And so how to make that happen uh, is something intellectually challenging. But I think that is one area that we can make the biggest contribution to poverty reduction sustainable growth in the developing world. And I'm so delighted now why there's is a leaders in this global forum on this issue. Mm -hmm.